Hi there. In this video, what I'm going to do is walk through what a design system governance process might look like. Uh, in my own work, I've found uh, establishing a clear and detailed process for uh, governing a design system to be one of the most crucial and vital pieces of the design system puzzle. Uh, very often what happens is Teams will come to the design system looking for components and they won't find what they need or you know, a component does exist but it, it gets them 90% of the way there but not the full 100%. So by sort of establishing a clear process uh, for, for sort of you know, getting to that 100% is really, really important because if you don't have a process like this in, in place, uh, uh, product teams can and, and will get super creative uh, either by hacking styles or sort of, you know, creating a bunch of one-off components that, that might not be necessary or really abandoning the system altogether. So it really is sort of an, an existential uh, threat to the system by not having a, a process in place for sort of making changes and updates to the system. So that's what this video is about, is just going to walk through um, what that process might look like by sort of going through this, this graph. So by default, a product team comes to the design system to help them design and build new work. And the best case scenario is that, you know, they come to the page, uh, they come to the design system, they find the component they need, uh, it fulfills all their requirements. Uh, so that means that they're able to sort of plug it into their product and they're just good to go, right? And that's the promise of design systems, right? You have these sort of, you know, reusable components that have already been made and already been sort of battle tested. And that sort of helps save a bunch of time and, and energy and effort and increases the quality of the products just by way of using that. So that's great. Uh, but that's not, uh, you know, all the time, right? So, uh, that's not 100% of the cases that, that everything is working just absolutely perfectly. So very often what ends up happening is that a product team comes to the design system and they either don't see the component they need or they're not sure, right? They, they don't know if, the, if the, the component exists. Or if a component does exist, uh, it might not fulfill all their requirements or do all the things that they need it to do. Or maybe again, they're just sort of unsure. So what happens in those scenarios is that the product team and the design system team need to get together and have a conversation to just sort of better understand the situation. Um, and this might take the form of the product team reaching out via Slack or submitting a GitHub issue or, you know, any number of things. And it's important to sort of define what that strategy, uh, what that protocol is for reaching out uh, to the design system for, for stuff like this. And what's great about sort of leading off with conversation here is that, uh, you know, very often we found that the design system team can sort of help redirect uh, the team to maybe a better solution, right? So the, uh, the product team comes in looking for something very specific and the design system team could actually say, oh, we actually have something that, that does what you need uh, sort of over here. It might not, you know, look exactly what you had in your mind or whatever, but like this is, this is the solution that we use for stuff like that. Um, and that sort of helps get them un unstuck just by way of having a conversation. So What's great is that, you know, so do changes, additions, or any new work need to happen? If the answer to that is no, you're just able to sort of solve uh, the situation uh, with a conversation, then that team is good to go, which is fantastic. But if that work, if the team sort of talk and they say, yeah, you know, new work does need to happen, uh, the next sort of question to ask is, is, is that new work part of the design system or is it a snowflake? And a snowflake, uh, you know, is sort of a one-off component is very sort of specific or product specific um, and just sort of is is might be might not be sort of able to be extracted into the broader design system very easily this might be like a, a mortgage calculator component or uh, a really intricate uh, data visualization or something like that um, 
And it might just be too complex or too specific in order to be sort of extracted into the design system. So if the teams determine, yeah, this is a Snowflake component, then the product team can sort of take that and, and run with it. Uh, but it's also important to, to point out that I said, in accordance with the design system Snowflake guidelines. And what I mean by that is that even though you know snowflakes can and do happen, the design system should sort of spell out some, some guidelines for creating snowflake components. And this is important for a couple of reasons. One, we want to make sure that the, the, the code quality and the design quality sort of you know is compatible with the design system. Um, and then that helps make uh, sort of refactoring the that Snowflake component into a design system component a lot easier down the road, right? So if if the Snowflakes are sort of following similar code conventions and structure and naming and stuff like that, then it's a lot easier to sort of like lift that thing into the design system down the line if that's necessary. Uh, the other thing that that this is important for for doing is is just sort of keeping track of Snowflakes uh, if you're finding that there's just, just hundreds and hundreds of snowflakes sort of lying around, that might be an indicator that the design system isn't doing all the things that it needs to be doing. And that could be problematic, right? So uh, all that's to say is like having some sort of guidelines in the design system for creating snowflakes is a really good idea. Um, but if that new work is considered to be part of the design system, then the work gets added to the design system backlog. And then from there, we sort of determine the level of effort and the roadmap priority. Uh, uh, and that's going to depend on a number of different things, right? You know, the urgency of it, you know, what the available resources are, uh, you know, what other things are on people's plate and stuff like that. And a big part of that will sort of determine who takes the first stab at creating uh, this work. Uh, so it might be the product team if they have more time and availability than the design system team, or it might be the design system team sort of taking a stab at this. But in any case, uh, from there, we sort of design and prototype a concept. And this might take the form of a napkin sketch, uh, you know, just a couple paragraphs or sentences sort of defining like what this thing is, maybe an in-browser prototype or, you know, quick sort of visual sketch or really the idea is to just sort of quick and dirty, get a sense of like, here's what this thing is, here's what work needs to happen, uh, just so everyone is sort of on the same page. And so once that concept is created, then the design system team and the product team sort of gets back together to review uh, that that concept. And if there's still work to be done, then they'll iterate over and sort of regroup until until everybody's happy. And once that work happens, then the actual sort of formal design and development process uh, begins in the design system. And this is, uh, you know, this is obviously where the bulk of the work happens, right? So in order to sort of get this new work, whether it's a new component or a new variation of a component uh, into the design system, we have to sort of add it to uh, you know, a tool like Sketch or Figma, if those things are in play at an organization, right? Um, so adding it to a library or adding a new component there. Uh, but then also, uh, it needs to be represented in code, right? It needs to be built, built in code. So this might happen, um, you know, in sort of a front-end workshop environment like Storybook or Pattern Lab or, or any number of these uh, sort of, you know, what I call front-end workshop environments. And the idea is to sort of build out that new component or that variation of, of the component, sort of get that represented in the in the workshop. And it's also important to, to note that the designers and the developers should be closely collaborating to make sure that that design vision and those design best practices are, are making their way into the living coded component, um, you know, just so it doesn't get, you know, sort of left and sort of trapped in, a sketch library somewhere, but the actual sort of coded version of it is, is, is not up to snuff, right? This thing is ultimately going to get packaged up and sort of shipped into other applications. So it's really crucial for the designer's vision to sort of, you know, get baked into the actual coded component. So whenever the, the component is in code, then you can start testing that component, sort of building this out. And this is, you know, 
in part part of the the development process, but some of the the steps are a little bit sort of special here. But at this stage, when we're testing the component, we're sort of testing things for, you know, sort of content and sort of internationalization sort of uh, uh, requirements and guidelines. So, you know, making sure that, you know, headlines don't wrap onto like five lines or if you, you know, sort of translate a title into German, it doesn't sort of break the design. Uh, we want to make sure that uh, the component sort of meets all the accessibility requirements, meets or exceeds them, and sort of is in, in line with the broader sort of accessibility guidelines of the system. We want to make sure that we're uh, testing across different browsers and devices uh, to make sure that everything uh, looks consistent. Uh, we want to test for functionality. This gets into things like unit testing and making sure that if you're creating an accordion component, for instance, that that accordion component is able to open and close. Uh, we want to test across the entire resolution spectrum uh, to make sure that, that you know, this works well in any sort of you know, responsive environment. This next one of, of trialing in an application is really, really helpful. Uh, one of the things, once we have uh, an MVP of this new component or variation sort of built, uh, one of the things that we found to be really helpful is to reach out to the product developers uh, and say like, hey, could you actually sort of try pulling this in and sort of wiring it up real quick? Um, and what this does is this sort of, you know, helps make sure that, you know, all the API endpoints that the developers need uh, are there, or present, accounted for. All like the the sort of hooks in there, um, but also sort of making sure that you know everything sort of works and doesn't blow up in in your face. And so this can happen, you know, before the thing is totally done and dusted. It's just sort of like a nice like confidence builder to make sure that it's like okay, yeah, this component is is working and it, it will work in the actual sort of application environment. Uh, from here, you can also uh, create uh, stress test stories and just sort of articulate, you know, here's like a common product situation, but here's like a kitchen sink version and just sort of like, again, sort of coming back to the content and stuff, making sure that it's able to sort of handle all these different scenarios. Uh, we obviously want to make sure that the component or variation uh, meets the, the code guidelines that uh, are sort of dictated by the design system. Uh, we want to make sure that the new component or variation is in line with the broader sort of design language and is consistent with the rest of the design systems components. And really sort of like any other QA or testing that you think would be uh, valuable for sort of bringing this component home. So once we're done with that step of the process, then we'll review uh, that, that new component or variation with the product team. Um, and this is really important just because obviously uh, a lot of things might shift uh, just based on, you know, between going from an initial concept to really sort of battle testing this thing and making sure it's, it's you know, resilient and versatile and flexible and all that stuff. So, um, so it's really helpful to sort of get back together with the product team to review that work. And if, you know, if more work needs to happen, uh, the team will sort of take that and iterate over it and sort of, uh, you know, do that until uh, the product team sort of signs off on that new work. So once sign off happens, uh, then the, the design system team can uh, sort of finish the documentation and get this thing ready for the next release. Um, so from a documentation perspective, uh, the that means sort of representing this new component or variation and getting that sort of present in the style guide website uh, for the design system, sort of documenting like the, the design and usage guidelines, but also sort of documenting like the, the, the API for the component and all of that stuff, updating the change log and just uh, at this stage from a, from a sort of a, a Git perspective, sort of merging in that feature branch into the development branch and getting it ready to, to go for the next uh, release. From here, uh, the team will sort of create enough work for a new release, and that might take the form of, you know, you might release every day or every, you know, two weeks or every month or really different teams. It really depends on your sort of culture and your organization and what you've sort of determined to be the right release uh, sort of cadence. 
Uh, but eventually that new work will get released and sort of like pushed up. Uh, the development branch gets merged into, man, uh, into the master branch. Uh, you sort of tag a new release, um, you know, according to the right semantic versioning guidelines. So if it's like new features, for instance, that would be sort of a minor version uh, update. Uh, so anyway, so yeah, so you cut a new release and publish that new release. And then you uh, communicate that new release via all the appropriate channels. So that might be sort of jumping into Slack to alert everybody. That might mean email newsletters. That might mean intranets. That might mean, you know, any and all places where, where sort of teams go to learn about sort of new, new updates from the design system. So now a new version of the design system exists. So now the product team can then sort of pull in that latest version of the design system into their application environment. And they could take that new work and sort of wire it up uh, to uh, their actual application environment. And if there are bugs found, then uh, the teams can uh, sort of address uh, those bugs and sort of submit uh, new bugs uh, based on the protocol laid out in the design system. But if no bugs are found, then that work is is good to go. And the next time that that application sort of launches its new version or pushes its latest changes, um, then you'll see that new design system work sort of live on the real product. So, whew. I'm just going to zoom out here because that was a lot of stuff. That was a lot of effort. Uh, I just want to sort of show how involved that is. And I think it's really important to sort of show how involved this process is because, you know, there's a lot of steps that happen between, you know, a team coming to the design system saying, ah, I don't see the component that I need to all the way to the end of the process, which is that new component is now launched and live on our, on a product. But again, I, I, I'll say it's so incredibly helpful and, and critical to sort of spell things out like this, just because without it, you know, there's a lot of anxiety, there's a lot of fear, a lot of people will just sort of go and do their own thing and go rogue. So laying out this process really helped helps to so clearly define you know the roles and the responsibilities of sort of creating this new work who does what and when and really does just sort of you know serve to to build trust between the design system teams and the product teams and just help everyone sort of be on the same page um i'll also say that it's really cool that uh you know obviously this is really important to uh, for governing a design system like long term and once you have a design system uh, and are actually able to sort of like play out this process is really important. But I've also found it to be really helpful even before the design system even gets started. Uh, so in some of my client work, we'll actually start by sort of going through this process and what that does is that actually sort of helps surface, you know, who the players are, or who the stakeholders are, when they need to be involved, and, you know, who needs consulted and stuff like that. It also sort of helps determine, you know, some tool choices like, oh, what issue tracker are we going to use? Or, oh, what, what communication channels are we going to use to, to sort of communicate new releases and stuff like that? Um, and just sort of helps bring to the surface like, okay, how are we going to be actually using this design system in our in our process as part of our ongoing product workflow? So um, it's helpful once you have the design system, but it's even helpful as an exercise to sort of establish uh, before the design system even exists. So uh, I hope you have found this helpful and uh, and thanks so much for for listening and uh, we'll see you next time.